<laughs> Especially in the Western countries, I've seen that people awaken at 5 o'clock to go to offices and factories to earn their livelihood. People in Calcutta and Bombay also do this every day. They work hard, very hard in the office or factory, and again they spend three or four hours in transportation returning home. Then they retire at 10 o'clock and again rise early in the morning to go to their offices and factories. This kind of hard labor is described in the Shastras as the life of pig and stool eater. Nayam Deho Deha Bhattam Hirloke Kastan Kavan Arhati Vid Bhutane Jongye of all living entities who have accepted material bodies in this world, one who has been awarded this human form of life should not work hard day and night simply for sense gratification, which is available even for dogs and hogs at each stool. Bhagavatam 551. One must fight to find time for hearing stream of Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. This is Vedic culture. One should work eight hours at the most to earn his livelihood, and then either in the afternoon or in the evening, a householder should associate with devotees to hear about the incarnations of Krishna and his activities, and thus be gradually liberated from the clutches of Maya. However, instead of finding time to hear about Krishna, the householders, after working hard in offices and factories, find time to go to a restaurant or a club, or instead of hearing about Krishna and his activities, they are very much pleased to hear about political activities of demons and non-devotees and to enjoy sex, wine, women, and meat, and in this way waste their time. This is not very hostile life, but demonic life. The Christian consciousness movement, however, with its centers all over the world, gives such fallen and condemned persons an opportunity to hear about Krishna. In a dream, we form a society of friendship and love, and when we awaken, we see that it has ceased to exist. Similarly, one's gross society, family, and love are also a dream. And this dream will be over as soon as one dies. Therefore, whether one is dreaming in a subtle way or a gross way, these dreams are all false and temporary. One's real business is to understand that one is soul, a humbrahmasmi, and that his activity should be different. Then one can be happy. Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma and Sochati Nakanchati Samasarvishu Bhuteshu Madhvakti Mabhate Padam. One who is transcendentally situated at once realizes the Supreme Brahman and becomes fully joyful. He never laments or desires to have anything. He is equally disposed to, toward all of the entities. In that state, he attains pure devotional service unto me. One who is engaged in devotional service can very easily be liberated from the dream of material life. We want one to the Daya Krishna Prasthaya with the name Sri Mata Bhakti Vedanta Sangha. Namaste, Sarasvati Deve, Lord Bhani Vacharani, Neva Vishesha Srimati, Vasita, Vesita, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Vedanta, Sri Sari Gaurava. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 So I want to apologize for coming late this morning. This is what happens when an elderly person does a lot of traveling. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm not really a a scholar nor a learned person. Ushua Prabhupada said that we should be able to speak Krishna conscious philosophy at a moment's notice. So here we are. <clears throat> so this uh, idea of association, uh, the first sentence is a Krihasta must associate again and again with the same person. This is stressed throughout our literature. The Shiva Prabhupada actually set up, as he describes in the purport, the International Society for Christian Consciousness for association. Uh, this is the whole purpose. And he also just 
describe and how whatever we associate with, we become like. So if we associate with drunkards, we'll become like them. We associate with uh, saintly persons, we'll also take on their qualities. So again, association with stress, uh, again and again. Uh, in the, I believe in the 11th canto, I don't have a verse, but there's a whole <clears throat> list of spiritual activities that, that Krishna himself describes to Buddha in the Buddha Gita. And he talks about austerity, studying the scriptures, uh, penance, uh, so many uh, items of spiritual life that we all practice. But in the end, he says association with saintly persons is the most important. And stresses that above all of them, actually. <clears throat> so, what does it mean to associate? What actually happens when we associate with the same person? Basically, everyone in material life, in this material world, is searching after one thing. And that's happiness. Uh, we can ask anyone you know, why they're doing what they're doing, and generally, it comes down to they want to be. Happen. And oftentimes, this, uh, these activities that they're engaging again and again and again, uh, mostly sense gratification, produces the opposite result. It produces unhappiness because it's simply uh, engagement of the senses with the objects of the senses. And in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that this is actually uh, in the beginning. Uh, happiness in the mode of passion. In the beginning, it's like nectar, and the end, it's like poison. So I give the example of uh, someone who first takes uh, an intoxicant, especially uh, hallucinatory drugs. And this has happened, of course, is going on, but it was rampant in the 60s. When I was going to school at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, from 1961 to 65. So when I first went to school, there were none of these drugs around. But about midway through, it just kind of hit the whole campus like a wave. And uh, everybody was trying it. And the first time, you know, you take it, there's a feeling of elation and happiness. And uh, but actually, every time afterwards, that feeling would decrease a little bit. And it's said that drug users, they're always trying to find that first high, and happiness from that first high, and therefore they keep taking again and again and again, but never get it. So this is happiness in the mode of passion. At first it's like nectar, and then it becomes like poison. So everybody is searching for a kind of happiness. And if we associate with one who is self-realized, then we can understand that he doesn't need happiness from any kind of material uh, input, material gratification. And he is naturally happy uh, in Christian consciousness. And we, then, then we see that he, yeah, he, doesn't, he doesn't need the things that normal materialists need to be satisfied. And therefore we can uh, understand that there's a happiness that's developed from uh, chanting Hare Krishna and following the principles, reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, as she describes here, that we don't need to engage the senses with their objects. And so this is, by association with those kinds of persons, we also, uh, number one, take hope from seeing their example, and number two, be able to follow their example by their association. <clears throat> so here Prabhupada says that by associating with devotees and coming to the temples, people can hear the topics of Krishna from Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, and they will be purified of their sinful inclination for constant indulgence. This is very interesting, interesting. Prabhupada says, constant indulgence. <coughs> and that's actually what's going on in their minds, most people. They're thinking how to satisfy the senses, and they're constantly thinking like this. 
We also have experience in the material life. There's constant meditation on basically proper outlines and illicit sex and eating and intoxication and gambling. So if one is addicted to these things, there's a constant meditation on how to enjoy these things. It's uh, all consuming. It's uh, a terrible state of consciousness. And uh, Prabhupada says that simply by joining the kirtan, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, and hearing about Krishna and taking prasad, one will become purified. So in our own life, we can understand this uh, principle of hearing the kirtan. When I, <clears throat> well, I went to university and then got out and went to the U.S. Peace Corps. I was overseas for three years in Malaysia as a teacher. So I, when I came back, they wanted to send me to Vietnam. That was the years of the Vietnam War, 1968. Or not, sorry, 1960, yeah, 68. It was actually the height, and uh, many, many people were being drafted. So I didn't want, didn't want to go. My brother was fighting in Vietnam. He was a jet fighter pilot. So he flew actually 500 missions in Vietnam. And I could see the disastrous effect it had on the people in Southeast Asia and also the disastrous effect on America and also on my brother, personally. He had a very difficult time after he got out, and, and during, of course. So, I was not eager to go, and I somehow got a letter from my, actually the Peace Corps psychiatrist, who was uh, training our group. And he gave me a letter that I was not mentally fit. <laughs> for fighting, which I wasn't. And uh, so I went to the induction center downtown Los Angeles and I gave a letter to the man at the desk and he looked at it and he said, oh, you've been in the Peace Corps, you can go home. <laughs> so I walked out the door and the first thing I heard was a very non party across the street <laughs> chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> And this, uh, actually, I could feel the effect of the mantra. It's described how the mantra works, actually. The mantra enters the ear <coughs> holes and, and goes into the heart. So I could feel very subtly, nothing, you know, nothing uh, really uh, stupendous, but I could feel that subtle uh, entrance of the Hare Krishna mantra into my heart. And then I heard it for a few seconds, and then I walked away for a year and a half. And then I went to school, uh, photography school. I had put some pictures I had taken in Malaysia in a photo agency in New York. Where they accept your pictures and the people looking for photographers, they take a look at the work and if they like their work then they ask you to, for a job they invite you to, uh, for an assignment. So my first assignment as a professional was to uh, cover the Hare Krishna movement in New York City. <laughs> and I could say that the first time I walked in the temple, I was very attracted to everything. <clears throat> so this is the wonderful effect of simply hearing uh, the mantra. And so therefore, these Sankirtan parties are, are wonderful. Are extremely important for preaching. We may not see the effect. It took me, you know, a year and a half before Krishna guided me back to the temple. But it has a tremendously powerful effect. And therefore, Prabhupada's genius was that he <coughs> introduced the Harinam Sankirtan as the full-time engagement in the early years. I didn't really participate in the Harinam Sankirtan. I was in India. I joined in India. But uh, Prabhupada's program for everyone, all the temples, was, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day Harinam. <coughs> and, uh, so downtown Los Angeles, that Harinam party that I saw, it must have been Vishnu Jamaswami because he was going out every day at that time on Harinam. So, <coughs> and, and so 
was a result. People took thousands and thousands, probably millions of pictures of devotees all over the country in Haryanam. So they had that remembrance. They also heard the party. And so the preaching uh, was, was huge in that way. <clears throat> the Prabhupada goes on in his purport to describe that one should not just read Bhagavad Gita once and not hear it again. Uh, this is a big, big mistake. Because any time that you hear Bhagavad Gita, it, it is beneficial. It doesn't matter how many times. It's all beneficial. Because it chips away at our material conditioning. Again, we may not feel it, but this is the effect. I remember one devotee, he went through all of Prabhupada's books, he reread everything again after some years, and then he decided there was nothing new, and he kind of gave up reading. So, uh, this is a mistake. Actually, there's a, a wonderful a club that Vaishya Sikha Prabhu has started. It's the chapter a day Bhagavad Gita club. And that means you read a chapter a day of Bhagavad Gita every day. And that's, it, never, it never ends. So he has people actually all over the world reading a chapter a day. And I, I highly recommend it <coughs> because um, we've heard it many, many times, but actually Bhagavad Gita, spiritual subject matter is always fresh. It's never uh, old. Um, then Prabhupada goes on to discuss how people are working very, very hard in their offices and traveling vast distances to go to their offices every morning and back. There's a wonderful conversation in our DVD series, uh, number nine, a Prabhupada in Los Angeles talking to a professor. And he poses a question to the professor. He says, he describes how people are rushing back and forth every day on four wheels. So he said, he said, is, is this, he asked the professor, is this progress? You know, just, just rushing around in, in, on four wheels. And the professor looked at him and he said, he said, of course, it's proper. <laughs> and Prabhupada looked at him and he said, actually it's not. It's not proper. And the professor was quite, quite stunned. Everybody thinks this is progress, but actually it's not. Because Prabhupada gave the reason why it's not. And that it's distracting us from our main business in life. So all these conveniences, all the you know, automobiles and, and big buildings and electrical factories and nuclear factories produce electricity, and these are all distractions from our real business. It just takes up our time and um, most often wastes our time. So this is very hard for materialists to understand. They think every, all this is progress. But we see this in this uh, recent tsunami in Japan. But actually that nuclear facility is still burning. You don't hear about it much in the news, but it's still out, basically out of control. So <clears throat> Prabhupada describes of course, in Bhagavad Gita this nuclear, the discovery of nuclear weapons is illustrates uh, the verse in the Chapter 15? 16. 16. What is that verse? Uh, People are engaged in unbeneficial, horrible works to destroy the world. The Prophet in the purport says that this is in, in a case, in reference to nuclear weapons, the invention of nuclear weapons. So this is all demoniac activity. And Prabhupada at the end of this purport talks about how waking existence is actually a dream. We think that we dream, only dream at night. But this waking existence is also a dream. 
And how is it a dream? Because it's temporary. It's not a permanent situation. Everything in the material world is in a constant state of um, flux or change. It's constantly mutable or change. It's always changing. So therefore, in that sense, it's not real. It's uh, false and temporary. So, our real business is to wake up from both dreams, the waking dream and the sleeping dream, and become uh, devotees, real devotees, Krishna conscious, all the time. So I'll stop here and are there any questions or comments about this subject or anything else? Yes. Uh, disciples of Srila Prabhupada, maybe third generation of Swedish this, uh, devotees, they were so austere and they had so little a low standard of living and our new generation we see how that caught by that and they cannot dedicate so much uh, to the movement and you are so experienced, maybe you analyze the situation and how a uh, uh, young generation <coughs> will take over and it's great. How can they be more engaged? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, there are many, actually many more distractions in this uh, day, day and age. The other day we were discussing Facebook how um, addicting it is. There's actually a disease now that refers to this addiction to be on Facebook all the time. Is there a name for that? FID, Facebook Addiction Disorder. <laughs> no, it's true, it's a medical term. It's a, term. It's a fact, yes. FAD. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a problem. I, my, uh, in our own family, we have not quite <laughs> to that level, but uh, it's a problem. These, these, these gadgets and uh, technology, it is a problem. You can become absorbed in the technology itself and forget uh, about hearing and chanting. And most often these technologies are used for just gossip. And Prabhupada actually, he, he rarely used the phone. So he, he always, he just wrote letters. And sometimes the letters would take weeks to arrive. But look what he did in the time he was here. And he indicated that these you know, long telephone calls are not necessary. Even, even short ones. So, <clears throat> You know, basically we have we have to set the example of a, a happy person, a self-realized person and fully satisfied without these all these things. And that's probably the strongest way we can we can preach. Especially since the young people are you know, right we're living with them and you know with a lot of times parents. We really have to set the example by our own do you think if uh, Prabhupada had been here today, he would kind of have uh, stopped this extensive use of, uh, I mean, of discourage it to devote to using it to like, I mean, like you say, fa Facebook, internet. Uh, mm -hmm. mobile phones, uh, maybe even jet planes to some degree. Yeah, probably. He, he discouraged use of, uh, you know, extensive use of the phone. Did he? Did he oh, yeah. um, of course, there was another aspect to it. On the internet, I had um, someone talking to me the other day saying how valuable they find the internet because they live in, in the country, you know, in, in, and um, because there's things like Mayapur TV mm -hmm. and Vrindavan TV, uh, they're able to attend festivals, they're able to go to Mongol Arctic every morning by way of the internet. So, um, 
our, I mean, our position, of course, as Prabhupada taught, and Srila Rupa Swami taught, you have Yukta Varagya, there's utilizing everything in Krishna's service. And um, certainly Srila Prabhupada set that example in flying around the world. And uh, although it's a dangerous place, uh, everywhere is a dangerous place. You know, we had you know, oh, that letter when uh, they wanted to remove all the women from the temple room during Japa period because it agitated the brahmacharis. And Prabhupada said, they, they can go live in the forest. He said, every day you're in the city and you're going out. He said, everywhere you go, men are there, women are there. And uh, the internet is certainly a very easy place to pick on uh, certain things. And Maya is everywhere there. But by the, by the mercy of the devotees, too, we now find places like Vrindavan. Uh, myself, now I you know, just left Govardhan and Vrindavan. But it's very easy for me to take darshan of Radhashan of Sundar, Krishna Balaram, and Gurnatai. Beautiful pictures of them every day that are there. Um, it's 24 hour kirtans. So many people are attending in different places around the world. There's others who never have the facility to attend them personally, but they're by live TV, by my TV, to attend these things. So and that's also there. Yeah, it's definitely there. The facility for preaching is actually amazing. I mean, uh, Sankarshan Prabhu is preaching like anything over the internet and has many disciples. And he's amazed on the, on the, you know, on the internet. Preaching on the internet. But we still have to be very, very careful because it, uh, it's very, uh, it can be very uh, polluting if we're using it in the wrong way. Radha Swami talks about the net, the internet. <laughs> Also, I think we have to remember that watching news <coughs> through internet is not the same as being personally there, because when you personally in the association of devotees, you, you do get that whole transcendental energy, which the camera cannot record. Paul Govindamarch describes that, and he says recordings are only in so far beneficial as it reminds you of that moment when you were there. And it, it, it cultivates the hankering in us to again go there. But otherwise, I'm sure we all have that experience when we, we look at a recording of a kirtan or we are present there, you cannot compare. You cannot compare. The recording is only, or the filming is only what the material eye can see. But that whole transcendental energy of consciousness of the people present, the sadhus consciousness, that's a very powerful energy which comes out through every pore of the skin and that the camera cannot catch. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Big <laughs> difference. <laughs> 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 And I just wanted to, to like another aspect again on the, the situation we have today where especially the Rastas have uh, more time into the family and the maintenance and so on, just like this verse is describing. Uh, I think it's a natural development because Prabhupada came first to establish the temples but he also wanted people around to be devotees. And in, I, I know Sweden, I don't know the rest of the world, it seems that our new, we're not recruiting new young people, so I don't think it's a fault that the Grahastas are living as Grahastas. I think the fault is that we are not having the same effort into recruiting new people, so that the ashrams are not full and we don't have that generation of young enthusiastic devotees. So, so one thing is missing. I don't think it was meant that we have 50 year old or 40 year old Grahastas going on the street cycling, and I think the Grahastasham should be established as a responsible place, but the, the problem is that we don't have the rest. The rest is not happening. Mm -hmm. And also with recordings, so I'm very grateful that we have the recordings of your problems. We could never have seen them mm -hmm. any other way. So I don't think that, the, the, of course, it was to meet him would have been different, but have that access. I think it's
mentioned in the beginning that Prabhupada created ISKCON for Sangha. Prabhupada gave his life and risked his life to make an organized Sangha all over the world because it's very important and uh, one has to be eager to take advantage. Even though one has all the other, <coughs> uh, Prabhupada himself, he was so eager to have Sangha when he's gone, you know, when he was a grass and fight an opportunity. Um, there is a statement by Bhakti Thakur that some song, uh, uh, I didn't, my, my Bhakti didn't grow or mature because I failed to take advantage of some song. There is something with maturing also. You are benefited by, mm -hmm. by listening to internet lectures and like that. And, but there is something that's missing also. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Prabhupada was insisting to take, take the song on as what you can. You know. You know, that very much some of so personal association also, especially in the Dhamma. Personal association in the Holy Dhamma. And therefore he asks us to come once a year, at least once a year to my you know, in urban Dhamma, for he established centers. Very important. I know my personal life, I really look forward to that and as the highlight of the year. That's my uh, could there be also another point? I mean, I personally use, uh, in my service, I use internet a lot. So I sometimes think that um, maybe we can think also like this is a net where we can catch people to Krishna. That's also one possibility. But uh, of course everything what you say is also right. But, uh, and that's why we should be very careful. But uh, it's everywhere. I mean, we can choose Prachalpa or Sangha everywhere. Right. Not just the <coughs> It's up to us yes. to make those. So it's our responsibility and our duty. Our make those proper choices. Yeah. Yes? mentioned about brahmanas you know but brahmanas they have the no normal occupation is uh, teaching and uh, receiving donations for teaching and worshiping the deity and uh, teaching others how to worship the deities uh, studying these are the normal occupation of the brahmanas and then it's described that but in time I mean and then let's describe there are, how is it, there are is it four kinds of occupation or like ways that Brahmanas can maintain themselves. And it's said then that uh, they can, how is it, they can co collect grains. grains. Uh, they, can, they can beg, they can collect grains which have been left in the marketplace or in the field. Uh, 
I suppose there are four kinds of occupations. And then they said, and but in times of emergency, uh, they can take to the occupation of Vaishyas, Brahmas. Uh, so, which means they can cultivate land and have a cow and like that. They will not get into becoming big time Vaishyas, but they can maintain themselves by being Vaishyas. <coughs> so, uh, I mean, they're. They're, they're, so it's recognized that at times of emergency, we live, live, we live in a time of emergency right now. Uh, you cannot really live like in a, in a, like, like a Brahmana or a Kshatriya or completely like that. Okay. But what I understand is that in these times, individually, you can live like a It's a, it's a, it's quite a big topic actually to get into. I mean, there, there are many principles that one can follow from an ashram, and uh, and some principles will not be able to be followed. It also depends on one's, uh, you know, if like I mentioned, children, for example, cannot just follow. Women also are weaker. Uh, for them, it's also more difficult to on their own. Uh, I say basically, probably Brahmanas can follow independently. They, they're quite independent. Uh, I, I mean, my point was there was a. Uh, uh, sometimes we think we have to, you know, be, until we get a kshatriya who actually, you know, strains everything out, and you know, everyone is probably designated like that. Before that, we cannot have any vanasram. My point is that that's not really correct. Uh, but ashram can be followed, I mean, on many levels, to, to many degrees, uh, by everyone. I mean, I'm sorry. Even, even women, I mean, uh, no, no, but, but even, even women, even though their husbands are unqualified, but they can still be chased. Uh, what was it? Uh, Mandodari was married to Ravana. She, was, she is one of the ideal chaste women in history. So Ravana is, uh, you know, in the complete Asura did not stop her from following her principles. Actually, she did not have, Ravana had a problem, she did not have a problem. She was able to follow her principles perfectly. Um, but I mean, it's a, uh, it's a huge yeah. time. I mean, it's just. I think it takes a lot yeah, yeah. yeah. to get into it. So. so I just like to make, yeah, just, just like we're discussing that. You're discussing how an individual in isolation from the system can follow the principles of our national government. I think also it ties into this whole internet discussion that a person in um, isolation without the advantage of association sometimes. In fact, you can always travel and think of association, but for most of the time, many people are, are, are isolated. But they also can uh, practice perfectly for the Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada is there through his books, and Krishna is within everyone's heart. So they can certainly be, most persons can certainly be delivered. Uh, even in isolation from the physical association. It depends on one's consciousness and desire. And so that's, I think that's really the crux of the whole. But of course it's you know, easier and more beneficial to be quicker for a personal association. So therefore we're trying for that as much as we can. But that does not uh, limit 
transcendental uh, potency. Yeah, you know, I was thinking um, to say the same comment that, that uh, it doesn't matter if I read a book or watch the internet. The question is how I take it. Because potency is there. Even internet, books, whatever, the potency is fully transcendent. The question is how I take it. Consciousness approach. I think it's simple. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Ye